This story may well make you weep too. More than a million starving refugees, many of them just babies, stranded in one of the most remote places on earth. Now, while billions of dollars have been spent fighting that war in Iraq, the world has all but ignored a catastrophe unfolding in Africa right this very minute. Now, that said, a few intrepid souls have braved appalling conditions to pitch in and do what they can to help. Among them, a husband and wife medical team from Sydney's northern beaches, Michael and Christine Shanahan, now facing the challenge of their lives. The sun has been up barely half an hour, and nurse Christine Shanahan is keen to get to work. Come on, 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 in the bus. There is so much to do. If the day ahead is like most, then by nightfall, Christine's efforts will have saved a number of young lives. Try and get somebody from over there if we can thin out the numbers. Christine's real job is as a nurse at Sydney's Mona Vale Hospital, but she's come to this refugee camp in the Sudan for Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, Doctors Without Borders. Working under plastic at this makeshift clinic, Christine runs the children's emergency ward. OK, if you start there, I'll try and get some out so there's space on the other side. If there are thousands of sick babies here in this one camp, how many people are there here altogether? Well, in truth, nobody knows. The camp itself is about five kilometres long in that direction and about one kilometre wide. When MSF first moved in here just three months ago, the count then was 17,000 people. Now the population has absolutely exploded and the government's own best guess is between 80 and 100,000 people. mother if the baby drank the milk before it went to sleep last night and again this morning without vomiting. The child got to the stage because there's not enough food. There's just not enough food. They're severely malnourished children. Christine is in Sudan with her husband, Michael, who's a consultant physician at Sydney's Manly Hospital. With a lifetime's experience and their kids grown up, the two wanted to make a difference. So they asked for six months' leave from their jobs. I respect him so much as a physician, and he's so good to every single child. 
Now, where is this Michael that you keep talking about? <laughs> He's in a place called Cass, K-A-S-S. It's up the road, we call it, about two hours away on a very bad road. The bone-jarring roads across the plains of Sudan are lonely these days because this area is a war zone. The Civil War, albeit. Darfur is in the west of Sudan, just south of Egypt. This is where the world of the lighter-skinned nomadic Arab herdsmen rubs up against that of the darker-skinned African farmers. The Arabs want the Africans' land, and the government of Sudan is arming the Arab against the African. Dr Shanahan's outpost receives the result of that fighting, the refugees. They had more than 200 admitted here in the first two days. The place was swamped with tiny children who were dying of malnutrition before our eyes. It was just appalling. Michael's diagnostic skills are vital here because there's virtually no equipment. This baby has cerebral malaria. If he was in uh, a hospital in Sydney, we'd know all the simple things you need to know. His hematology, his biochemistry, his renal function, his blood sugar level, all the simple things which are so readily available to us and are just not available here. The disgraceful fact is that this is an entirely man-made crisis. On the African side of the conflict are rebel movements fighting for the rights of the African farmer. On the Arab side is a brutal government-backed militia known as the Janjawi, an Arabic word meaning a devil with a gun on a horse or a camel. It's hopelessly one-sided. The Sudanese government has even used aircraft against mud hut villages. It's straight out ethnic cleansing. 30,000 or more are dead. Much more than a million are refugees. From the stories told in the refugee camp, what generally happened was that a plane or a helicopter would fly over, maybe drop a bomb or two, but anyway, scare the living daylights out of the people. They'd flee to the hills, and then the Janjaweed, supported by government troops, would simply ride into town, loot the place, and then burn it to the ground. Mother? My mother is... Your father? My father is... Okay. Your brother? This boy lost his whole family a month ago. The murderous thugs who did these things, the Janjaweed, still ride around here as if they own the place. And the reaction of the so-called international community, it's a joke. In this country, a third the size of Australia, there are a mere 80 foreign observers simply reporting on what these criminals are doing. Janjaweed? No, 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 my feet. Uh-huh. No. No problem. No, Janjaweed. Okay. Okay. And do you think they're Janjaweed? Sure. They Our interpreter, yeah. a Sudanese African, was in no doubt. And so these are the guys that have been robbing the villages? That's correct. <laughs> the 
The Shanahan's job is to deal with what's <coughs> left behind after the Janjaweed have ridden on. Michael recalls particularly well a very sick four-year-old who just wouldn't respond to treatment. So I thought what I should do is start again at the beginning. And I knelt down on the, on the ground beside the mother and just said to the mother, OK, so how did this begin? How did it get like this? And she just said, it's been like this for four months, ever since her father was holding her in his arms when he was shot. And the kid's been like this ever since. This wasn't a sick body so much. This child had been traumatised by being there when her father was killed. But the biggest battle of all is with malnutrition. It leaves little bodies open to anything going. This is another malaria case, and right now, he's just hanging on. That kid in the corner last night, we were all working on him last night, and this morning he came in, he looked a bit better. But he died this afternoon, you know. You just try not to think about it too much. Maybe you'd think, what's the use? You know, what's the use in going and trying to save 150 kids when every day there's more people coming in here? Um, so the plight of the people is the fl it's terrible, terribly moving if you think about it too much. In a sense, the solution to this crisis is simple. The government and its proxy, the Janjaweed, must be made to stop the race-based killings. But how? The UN is split between those who need Sudan's oil and those who don't. So the compromise is a flogging with a feather. First, graduated financial sanctions. Graduated sanctions? Well, that really means not being able to use your MasterCard. An arms embargo? Anybody here who wants a gun already has one. American troops? Well, given their failure in Iraq, they're out of the question. Even if a meaningful United Nations or African force could be gathered, what would you do with the troops? I mean, stationed some at each of hundreds of burnt-out villages? But then, without those troops, there may be another Rwanda here in the making. What do you take out of it? What do we get out of it? The satisfaction of having done it, I think, uh, knowing that we have helped people. And there have been times when I've come away from this job thinking uh, that was good today. There were four kids who would have died except we intervened and did various different things. Are there some nights when you can actually do that? There are, there are some nights when you can do that. And now we think they're well enough to risk sending them home. Um, and we're going to give them a packet of food for one week. And the mothers have to take it on themselves to give it to the baby every day. Is this the hardest part? Because, I mean... <laughs> this is the easiest. This is the happy part. Yeah. This you, is... you shouldn't be sending them home. Um, you have to. These kids are fantastic to when they came in. This kid, look, look, look. Look at that. <laughs> That's a weight gain. All right? That's splendid. The kids not, kids not got pneumonia. The kids had malaria treatment. It obviously had malaria. Um, it's well again. So this is a success story. Most of these people arrive here with next to nothing at all. Somehow, they scrounge together a few sticks and some tattered plastic and manage to build a home. And it just tears at the heartstrings to see them, just like you and me, trying to keep the home neat and tidy. Let's give it to they're, these kids are survivors. They, they've been through so much. They seem to just bounce back, you know. 
remove them from the conditions and they're likely to get better. So maybe next week, maybe in a month, we'll be back home. Maybe. Yes, <laughs> but they've got nowhere to go. Yeah. Hello, I'm Tom Steinford. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au as well as the 9now app.